I don't know about you, but I've really been enjoying this, uh, this series in Luke. And um, two weeks ago, Adam spoke to us about, about um, in, in Luke chapter 6, which is one of my favorite passages. Adam spoke about loving your enemies. And, um, and Jeeves spoke about uh, the second half of Luke chapter 6, about... Um, Whatever he said, I can't remember now. But it, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly moved by verse 35 because it is one of my favorite chapters in all scriptures, which says, But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High sons and daughters, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. What that says to me is that if I want to be like my heavenly father, there is a calling upon my life to be kind and merciful, even to the unthankful and the evil. And I was given a book last year for my birthday called um, Just Mercy. It's not a Christian book, but God was all over it. And I couldn't put this book down. It's about this man who gave his life to helping people caught up in the American criminal justice system, which is barbaric beyond measure, they seem to throw people in prison and throw the key away. Often, people from ethnic or poor backgrounds that don't have the money to, to um, defend themselves with um, appropriate lawyers. Uh, the book is about one particular black man that was wrongly accused of murder, sentenced on death row, and... Uh, it was just about the, the whole process about his release. And, and the, whole, the whole book was about interspersed with other people that he encountered as he gave his life just so sacrificially. And I remember thinking at one point, God, this is so bleak. Where are you in all this? And he, was, he responded to me immediately. I'm in the heart of Brian Stevens, this man who wrote the book, and others like him who are bringing my message of love and mercy to these, not only to the prisoners, but also the prison guards. And he wrote this, mercy, mercy is just when it is rooted in hopefulness and freely given. Freely given. Mercy is most empowering, liberating, and transformative when it is directed to the undeserving. So that's how Jesus shows mercy to us. Amazing. Um, So I'm going to talk to you today about faith and compassion. We're moving on to Luke chapter 7. And um, this... Where do I point this? I'm pressing every single button here. Could you put the next slide? Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, this is Ignatius of Loyola, who uh, lived in the 16th century. Ignatius was a Spanish Basque Catholic priest and theologian who co-founded the religious order called the Society of Jesus in 1541. He was a devoted follower of Jesus. And he set his priests various kingdom exercises and this is one of them. I'd like, it, I'd like to read it out to you. 
He says, imagine meeting someone whom you immediately recognize to be a man or woman of outstanding intelligence. Could have been my friend last night. Deep compassion, astounding competence, and unquestionable trustworthiness. Others also recognize these qualities. And this person quickly gathers a following. Imagine him or her offering you the following call. He says, my work is to overcome all injustice, all poverty, and all disease. I want you to join with me in this. If you do, however, you must be prepared to devote your whole life to our cause, so that afterwards you may share with me and many others in our victory. How would you respond to that invitation? How compelling would it be to you? But consider this invitation from Jesus. To me, to you, and to the whole of the human race. I am come, this is Jesus, I am come to inaugurate the kingdom of God and bring a reign of love to the world. I will conquer everything that afflicts you and the world. Disease, sin, suffering, injustice, poverty, ignorance, and even death. Come and join me so that I, might, so that I may first lead you to the Father's healing love and saving grace. Then take up your place beside me, sharing my labor, sharing my suffering, and sharing the victory that is certain. Wow. How's that make you feel? We want to be part of this great plan. As I've pondered this over the recent days, just think again, God, I'm in. I am in on this plan that you've got. I totally trust you, Jesus. You are the Savior. There is no one else like you that can heal all injustice, heal all diseases, raise me from the dead, and have a place for me next to you in eternity for all days to come. Am I willing to give my life this to you? Yes, I am. And the same question goes out to you. So as we read these passages in Luke, two passages, I'd like to suggest that you engage with your sanctified imagination. Place yourself in the gospel scenes. Witness what Jesus does and says. How does that make you feel? Does it cause you to take any, uh, make any reflection, make any adjustments in your life? What is God saying to me through these passages? So let's read the first one. Luke 7. Jesus heals a centurion servant. Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. I just want to pause for a moment. Are, are you engaged with people that work with you or under you? in your daily life? How are you treating these people? I met with my secretary, my old secretary, um, last weekend at, my, uh, at Helen's baptism. And she was saying, after seven years of just suffering 
mistreatment after mistreatment by her employer. She'd handed in her resignation because she couldn't take any more. Here we have the centurion, who's a Roman soldier. Has power at his fingertips. He's got a heart for his servant. So he sent the elders of the Jews off because he'd heard about Jesus. And it says, when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Next slide. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, and those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. So the central figure in this passage, apart from Jesus, is the, the centurion, the Roman soldier, called a centurion because he's got a hundred soldiers underneath him. And clearly he's got other members of his staff, household, including this servant, a Roman soldier, part of the enemy occupying forces of Israel. He was a Gentile and not a Jew. His servant, stroke slave, is gravely ill, and the centurion has run out of all options. But he hears that there's someone called Jesus who is empowered by God to heal the sick. Here we see Jesus right away after chapter 6 in chapter 7, demonstrating what it looks like to love your enemies. They invite him to go, and he starts to go. Interestingly, it's interesting to me that the Jewish elders wanted to give Jesus a reason. And they said, you must come because he's worthy, because he's built us a synagogue. From the scripture, it's not a claim that the centurion makes. And as we see, he even later says to Jesus, I'm not worthy to come, but just say the word and my, my slave will be healed. But it's interesting how often that we believe that we have to do something to make us worthy for God to come to us. We try and twist God's arm up his back. Lord, have you not noticed how good this man is? But that is to deny the nature of God and his love for us. God is totally other-centered, giving himself in love. Not for one moment is he ever self-centered. Not for one moment. In the Trinity, they are constantly giving of themselves in love. And we find through Jesus, God sending his son into the world, that he's, he's giving his son in love, that he can make the Father known and salvation 
available to his people. As Ian said earlier, that I will be the, their God and you will be my people. Centurion recognizes he can't make he can't make he can't do anything to make himself worthy that Jesus should heal his servant. And he even recognizes that. I don't know what was going on in his head, but he sends out another delegation to Jesus as he's on his way. And he says, you don't even have to come. I'm not worthy to have you in my house. Demonstrating great acts of humility. Like John the Baptist, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And you and I have no claim. It is the love of God that has won us. The unadulterated, totally giving love of God that has won us. We sometimes think that we've done something to earn it, that he should come to us. But it's not true. It's a gift. It demonstrates more of the love of God and the nature of God that we're his people because he's come to us. As the, we read earlier, the centurion said, just say the word that my servant will be healed for I am a man placed under authority having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go. And he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. He recognizes from all the testimony that he's heard about Jesus that Jesus is graced with the power of God to heal people where the kingdom of God comes and encounters people like you and me on a daily basis. And Jesus commends the centurion that he's not heard faith like this in all of Israel. And the servant is immediately healed. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance, or that's the realization of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it also says, without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he, he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It doesn't take much faith. Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus describes it as like a grain of mustard seed, the tiniest of seeds. that can move a mountain and throw it into the sea. We come to Jesus with faith because he's given us the gift of faith. And then I do all that I can to stir up this gift that he's given me. As you do, to stir up this gift of faith by reading the scriptures, by worshipping him, it's by spending time in his presence by gathering together as a community of believers, encouraging and edifying one another. But when we do all, and when our pray prayers are not answered, and if we're honest, we've all been there. We've prayed prayers where we believe we've been acting in faith. What do we do then? It doesn't negate or diminish one iota Jesus' words or the presence of God. We just acknowledge that we don't yet know everything. We're learning. And as we sing, as we sung this morning, I will trust in him alone. For his endless mercy follows me. 
We've had some traumatic events in our family life over the years that has brought us to our knees. I would have that things could have been different. But one thing I am sure and I know, he has always, always, always been with us. Never left us. I just engage with his presence in my heart. The living God. The living God comes and makes his home in our hearts with the assurance that one day we'll be with him. But even so, we are seeing more miracles these days than we've seen for years and years and years. I want to say to you, don't let disappointment rob you of your destiny or your relationship in God. I, went to, I was invited to play golf in Birmingham the other week. And on the, uh, um, at the end of the, when you play golf in these societies, you have a dinner afterwards, and it was very nice. There was a big roast beef joint that came out, and it's lovely. And, uh, and on our table, I, I sort of thought, I'll recognize that man. And... Um, it happened to be, I won't mention his name, but it happened to be a former Premier League team football manager. So he's been on the telly a lot. He got the sack, as they all seem to get the sack, when you don't keep winning. But, and he's living in India. And it was clear to me that he was seeking after God. And um, in the end, I, I had to say to him, I just need to ask you, has nobody ever introduced you to Jesus? And he sort of looked at me and said, my mum went to church and she died a terrible death. And it was like, it was, it was like he sort of nailed the nails in the coffin of Christianity because his mom died a terrible death. And he was disappointed. But there is no disappointment in Jesus that I found. It's completely true, like no other. Don't let disappointment deter you from pursuing and seeking after God. What I realize is that my willfulness, I can't make God do what I will. I surrender to him. I seek to align myself so that his heart becomes my heart. His desires, my desires. His will, my will. Next slide, please. And here we look at this amazing event recorded for us in history by Luke. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd, he seemed to have a large crowd everywhere with him, Jesus. I want you just to invite you again, place yourself in this crowd. Try and witness what Jesus does. How it makes you feel in your spirit when you, when you see this. What are you saying to me, God, as I, as I read these scriptures? And when he came near the gates of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. 
and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. So here we have Jesus traveling from Capernaum to Nain, about 20 miles away, a day's journey with a large crowd. And as he's approaching the city walls, the gates are open. And out comes this funeral procession. Just picture it. They didn't have coffins like we had in these days. It was a plank of wood with a body wrapped up in a shroud. Probably died that day because it was so hot, you, you need to bury dead bodies in hot countries the same day. Outside the city walls. They're carrying this body on this plank of wood and they're mourning. Another event in the life of Jesus. where the kingdom of God invades earth. And the basis of the miracle is Jesus' compassion. There are at least five occasions in Scripture where we read of miracles arising from Jesus' compassion. The word compassion, the derivative of the word in the Greek, is from the bowels, deep in his inner gut, comes this deep movement of passion for this widow whose only son has died. Jesus' heart and emotions are perfectly aligned with the Father. Perfectly aligned with the Father. He feels the, heart, the Father's heart for this lady. He interrupts the funeral service and touches the body. Something under the law that would be would be wrong to do because you're not allowed to touch dead bodies. He trumps all that. And he speaks to the condition. Young man, I say to you, arise. And as we, as we read, the young man sits up and he, kiss, he presents her to his mother. We're not told Jesus' relationship in his spirit with the Holy Spirit and the Father. I don't know whether he's saying, Father, what are you saying right now? Or just that he's so moved with the Father's heart of compassion that he he is compelled to break in, knowing that the Father wants to heal the Son, to raise him from the dead. When Jesus prays for people, he always speaks directly to the ailment. He never says, worse the effect, if it is in your will, O God. He knows who he is and the authority that God has given him to speak into against the ailment. How do you feel about this passion, uh, this uh, passage? Do you feel a bystander? Are you caught up with the joy that comes to this family? This grief that is completely turned upside down. The reality is that you and I cannot of ourselves will compassion within our hearts. There's a tension here. 
Because if you're like me and you want to align yourself to Ignatius's kingdom exercise that I have done and that I do on a daily basis, I realize I need to gain the Father's heart for my desires to be aligned with his desires, for my will to be aligned with his will. The kingdom of God and God's will are completely um, the same thing. They're indistinguishable. Here on earth as it is in heaven is the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus spoke about grounding yourself in Jesus very helpfully last week. Just want to say a little bit about what it might look like to ground yourself in Jesus. Because I believe days are coming where we will see bigger and greater miracles than we have ever seen. I believe a move of God has already started to take place across the nation and the nations. I believe we will see bodies raised from the dead again. I'd love to be involved in that, wouldn't you? One John five fourteen says, "This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask." We know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. The book of Romans teaches us that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. So I daily spend time in God's presence. I am praying more and more for God's will to be done in my life and Kim's life. I'm not holding out any plan B's in case God doesn't turn up. There are no secondary plans. I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. In him. I will go, I will do in my heart wherever he sends me, whatever he asks me to do. Even the small things like praying for that young couple last night. Such joy doing his will for that young couple and seeing God break into their lives. I pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. His will is not just who I marry, what job I do, what country I live in. It is my daily, daily walk with him. I look to go with the flow of what's happening in my life. Not to be swimming against it, which is hard work. Not to be going down some little eddy which traps me. Of course, there is a balance in this because I recognize there is the flesh and the kingdom of self that wants to remain the king of my life. But overall, I give my life to him. So I keep surrendering my life to him. To his will and his ways. And I invite his presence. I try and hear what he's saying to me. God, what are you doing in this situation? Is there anything you want me to do or want me to say? I try and see and I ask to see through his eyes and hear through his ears what he sees, what he hears. My job is to try and align myself with what he's doing, not what I want to do. This is the journey for all of us, prodigal children returning to our father who even now is running to greet us as we come to we stand together so
Gott bringt es von ihnen durch. Oh God, when we read the scriptures, we are just blown away, Jesus, by you. I'm blown away by the love of God. I'm blown away that your love has come into my life, transformed me, and he's still transforming me. I'm blown away by these four youngsters that have given their life to you, Lord. Because the kingdom of God is always expanding. The love of God is always creative. It's always giving. And we, Father, put your hand on your heart. Just, you know, we can't do this on our own. We need his help. So we, Lord, as we choose to follow you, we, we commit our lives to you afresh again today. We surrender all. Thank you. Lord, thank you for these miracles that we've read about. And we pray, let your kingdom come, your will be done. Let your kingdom come, your will be done in this church. Let your kingdom come, your will be done in this nation. Let your kingdom come, your will be done in the nations of Europe. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in my life, in our lives. Even today, tomorrow, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.